Happy morning. Good morning. Happy morning. Oh, I love it. Hallelujah. Can't help but be happy to be oh, no, awake today. You know, I thank God the first time I opened my eyes, I'm like, thank you, Lord, for a beautiful weather. Can't go any wrong, any better, you know what I mean? God is a good God to us. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for the word you gave us to my brother Matt here, Lord, reminding us of the importance of your word. God, thank you for your word. Thank you for Jesus, the word of God. Thank you for his life, his death, his resurrection. Thank you for his highly, high priestly ministry right now, interceding for us, even as we await his return. May you be praised, honored, and glorified, Lord. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen, amen. Hallelujah. You're blessed? Anybody here today for the first time, not with us last night? Wow, we have a handful. I'm going to repeat last night's sermon then, for your sake. Sorry for the rest. You surely came for good reason. Well, glory to God. It's been heard by millions, personally received thousands and thousands of letters and emails and phone calls. It's been clear to a lot of people, made clear to many unbelievers, convincing them, convicting them to be real with God. My story is not mine. It's the story of Christ, who is actively involved in my life. And I'm openly inviting him daily to be in charge. That's what matters most. We may, all, we may all come from different walks of life, but we are all walking in the same path of glory. Wide is the road that many choose. Narrow is the one that a few find and walk in. Many are called, but few are chosen. When Christ was here, a tremendous crowds gathered around him. By the end of his story on earth, you can count a handful only remaining. Even the handful went into hiding the night Christ was taken in to custody. Even his number one staunch supporter, Peter, would deny him. Christ knew all of that, and yet he dared to travel from his kingdom to come to a humanity that, did not, that did, they did not lay a red carpet welcome to the king of glory. There was not even a hotel room available for him. He was born in a humble manger and grew up in a very humble home. By trade, he became a carpenter. The carpenter's son knew how to build. That was his ministry, still is today. He builds people like you and me, from boys to manhood. And this conference is meant for that reason. We are called to be, oh, they didn't show it, adopted to succeed. If you think you are not successful, this is your opportunity to change your mind. Adopted to succeed, standing your ground. You know, we live in a world today where the ground is shaky, but we are not those who shake because of a shaky ground. We are those who stand firm because we don't fix our eyes on the things we see. We fix our eyes on the things we do not see. 
The things we see are temporary. The things we do not see are eternal. So when the shaking of the earth takes place, we are not to run here to the north or the south, the east or the west. The Bible calls us to stand. We're standing on solid rock. If Christ is our Savior and Lord. The word of God is replete and littered with so many of God's great and precious promises. I don't know about you. I love reading the word. Because there I read my earthly and eternal kingdom benefits. I've never found them in any. You know, we've transferred from one insurance company to another. It's because it's required by law. But my insurance it is in the kingdom of heaven. It is in the word of God. My driver's license expires, but my preacher's license will not expire. People ask me, how old are you, Pastor Wally? I'm said, I'm, I, I tell them, most people, I'm old enough to, for you to call me your dad. <laughs> in my travels throughout the 50 states of the USA, I've met all kinds of ministers of the gospel on, from different walks of life, and different age categories. And most of the time, after they hear me speak, and we're getting ready to say goodbye, they say, Pastor Wally, you're old. You know, my pastor retired five years ago when he became 65. I look at this young man, I'm like, wow. May the Lord continue to bless him. So he asked me, when are you retiring? I've thought of that many, many times, I said. I've considered it seriously several times. But whenever I read the Bible, I have not found any verse in the Bible that says to me the age when I should retire. Because Christ says this. You go to all the world and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them everything whatsoever I have told you. And I will be with you. I am, the great I am, is with you all the days till the end of age. The end of age is that 60, 55, 65, 70, Lord. He didn't give a number. The end of age. For as long as my age on this earth has not stopped, I will not retire. But I will retire. Put on new tires. <laughs> I've learned it from the American culture. When the thread is really thinning out, they retire. <laughs> I can't get it why ministers think of a number. I don't see it there. So yes, I will retire and keep retiring. I need to have brand new tires. Amen. Because you know what? When the rubber hits the road, the road is not always paved with concrete. The roads are, are bumpy, full of obstacles and hindrances. I love bumpy rides because it shakes me up. Most people like the freeway. When you hear, when you hit a little hole, you go, oh my goodness. Good reason enough to complain when there's more that's paved ahead of them than the potholes in front of them. That's not the Christian life. The Christian life is full of potholes. But we walk through them smoothly because we're walking on cloud nine. No matter how dig the devil dips, or dig, digs and digs and digs to trap us, we will never be trapped by the enemy. We have a Savior who is faithful and good. And if you truly know him, 
nothing in this lifetime will hinder you. You will keep loving him, worshiping him, and serving him. You will keep praying, Lord, use me for as long that I am useful to your kingdom. When I said that, my brothers, I mean, don't be found useless in the kingdom. Don't be found useless by your own spouse, your family. When I was hit with terrible COVID, I came close to death twice. Twice I was given lung surgery. But I told my wife and my daughter all the time, I'll keep serving him. I'll always be productive for my family. When I get to be home, I said, and they said, oh, we don't want you to get home because the doctor said you have a few days to live. I said, no, don't listen, listen to me. When I get to be home, I'll start working in the backyard again. I start washing dishes again. I, still, I start vacuuming the house, the floors, washing the cars, gassing up, changing, retiring them. And that's what I still do. I'm like anyone else, normal as can be. I still breathe the same air you breathe. I still enjoy the same sun you enjoy. I can eat the same food you eat, but I'm more careful now. Because I'm more mature now. <laughs> Young people, you don't care. Just go eat. Go to your favorite fast food. The world system is fast food, fast lanes. In the kingdom, it's not. Some of us have learned the hard way. It's not easy to serve the Lord. You heard it this morning. But it's the best benefit in life. Serving God needs energy. We need stamina, strength. We need power and enablement. That's why so many ministers end up burned out. In a few years' time, they're only like 45, 35. They're walking away from ministry already. They're burned out. God did not intend for us to be burned out. Elijah thought he was burned out, but he ran so fast at an old age. Moses thought he was retired. Went farthest from where he served. He used to serve. Living in the middle of a wilderness. Nobody knows him. But God does. He thought I walk away from all the plans of life, the prosperity, everything I own, the power I wielded, the pleasures I enjoyed in life. I have walked away from all of that. Now you're calling me back? God is saying, I'm not calling you back to the old life that you had. I'm calling you back because my people are captives. I want to see them set free. People need to be free for one reason. He told Pharaoh when he faced the Pharaoh, let God's people go. And the Pharaoh defied him a few times, several times. But in all of this, there was only one reason why Moses was saying that. Let God's people go to worship him. We cannot worship God when we are under false gods. When we are under the thumb of dictatorial governments. When we rely and depend so much, so much thinking of entitlement mentality, we cannot enjoy the power and the presence of God. To live for God is to die to self. To die to self is the open invitation for God to come in and take and be in charge. Oh, I hope I'm getting through. I have served the Lord 40 years, brother. 40 years now, glory to God. I did not tell, I did not stay, I did not start well and good, but I started baptized in water 
and baptized in the Holy Spirit. And I'm not a finished product. I learn every day that I need more and more of Christ. Every day I find the need to keep reading the word where I find my earthly and eternal benefits. I find the need to spend more time with the source of life and power. I find myself curving enough time of each day to be found in his presence. In his presence with his word before my eyes. In his presence with an open heaven above me. I pray and intercede. Most of my prayers, 99.9%, is not about me. It's about people. Those that occupy the heaviest part of my prayer that are really burdens in my heart are the problematic Christians and the lost world. They are like a weighing scale. Sometimes the problematic Christians weigh heavier and sometimes the lost people weigh heavier. It goes like this every now and then. Thank God for that. God is showing me my own imperfection. I am on this side now, but I see myself going like this. I need God's grace. And Jesus, the Bible in John said, he is full of grace. No wonder the Apostle Paul would begin his letters with the words, grace and peace to you. From God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. Mr. Yoder, good morning. You look so dignified today. <laughs> Hallelujah. I love you, man. Grace and peace to you. From God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. I used to pastor a church in Illinois. I, I planted a very small congregation there. Our youth was about 120. I told them, I would call them, I'd make calls. Hello, Pastor Wally. I'm like, grace and peace to you. Hello, Pastor Wally. Grace and peace to you. When I left Chicago, moving to Sacramento, far in the, in the West Coast, those young people, the adults, continue to call me. They still recognize me as their pastor. Many came to faith because of my witnessing to them. I bled many to the cross of Calvary. So they would still call me. But I was blown away. When I, I saw, yes, they say, grace and peace to you, Pastor Wally. See, I think it would take time for them to learn the lesson after I'm gone, then it would hit them hard. What Pastor Wally was greeting us with was very biblical. The Apostle Paul was the most biblical person. He was, he was imitated, if I may use the word, but the, the same spirit that moved Paul moved St. Peter. Peter, in his greetings, the two epistles, said the same thing, grace and peace to you. Why grace? Because grace is what you and I need. Grace lies between the cross and the rapture. After the rapture, we don't need grace. We don't. It is right here and now that we need grace. And if you are not a man of God, you would not know it. True men of valor know that they live and move and act. And here we live and move and do our own things because of his grace. There's no escaping it. If you take away grace, you can preach the mightiest sermon. You have not done a good service to God because it's your energy, your power, your knowledge. You can graduate in a theological seminary, even have a PhD, and be on television and admired by millions. 
But if you're doing it on your own effort without grace, you're nothing in the kingdom of God. It is the grace of God that enabled fishermen. They smell like fish. They talk rough language. Unlearned according to the scribes. And yet, they were men transformed by the grace whom they encountered for three years. Grace walked among them. Grace lived in their midst. Grace ate with them. Grace was witnessed by them. They were exposed to grace every day while they were with him. Because grace is in the person of Christ. And after that, when he left, look at the book of Acts. Those men became graceful men. Peter, who used to be the most aggressive, became a very gracious person. Paul, who approved the witnessing and witnessed the stoning to death of the first Christian martyr named Stephen. He was then known as Saul of Tarsus. He was a Pharisee of Pharisees. In other words, in our world today, he had several PhDs admired by people. He knew the Torah. He was aware of the God of Jehovah, Yahweh of the Old Testament. He was a stickler to Judaism. He didn't want anything to come between him and Judaism. But you see, grace is a way of penetrating religion. Grace has a way of infiltrating the most religious heart. Yes, grace has a way to transform you and me. And before you know it, you're living in the grace. But until you read it and know and understand it in the Bible, you'll never comprehend the true meaning of grace. In today's world, you can Google grace. It's God's unmerited favor. I repeat, it's God's unmerited favor. In other words, we do not deserve it, but he gave him to us. God so loved the world that he gave us his only son, full of grace and truth. Men of God, to be man, a man of God, you have to live and understand what it's like to live in the grace of Christ and in the word of God. Grace and truth are perfect combinations that will take us from this life till the rapture or earlier if the Lord chooses to take you home sooner. These are the things that you and I carry, that we possess. They must be deeply ingrained in your heart and mind. Because if you're a man of grace, it will be so difficult for you to criticize another human being. Grace saw the sinner and became a saint. Grace saw an adulterer, an adulterous woman, and become a child of God. Grace saw tax collectors and become followers of Jesus. Grace made the blind see. Grace set the captives free. Grace is all over the place wherever Jesus was. He you hang out with unbelievers. Not one who was healed was a believer. Not one. But they experienced grace of God. And they knew that great, the source of that grace was Jesus. The world was changed because of Christ coming into the picture. How many of us invite Christ daily to come to our, the picture of our everyday life? How many of us ask the Lord to be involved? You know, we are so much into, I'm involved in this ministry. I'm involved in doing that. Oh, we want to make ourselves look good to people. You know, another point here, another point there. Oh, we have a prayer ministry. Oh, I'm also involved in prayer. We want to be involved. 
But how much of our involvement really involves God? How much is He really the reason why we are involved? Or we are involved because it's just on the side. I want to grow. I want to hang out with the best preachers. Really? Hang out with the preacher maker, Christ Jesus. I want to read the latest book, the number one bestseller. I recommend this. It's been number one ever since. They continue to sell more, more of this than any other book. People ask me, do you read other books? Of course. Which book do you read, Pastor Wally? I was in John's book yesterday. Today, I'm in the book of Timothy. How many books do you read? I have a lot of books to read. <laughs> It's not easy to finish one book because the Spirit speaks to me. You can, book and you can read a book. I read a book. Years back, I would read a book. I could finish it in one sitting. This, I've never done that. In one sitting, I get only this much. And I'm overwhelmed. I'm moved to tears. I'm laughing in the Spirit. I'm rejoicing with the grace of God, Jesus, my Savior. With this, I have more than enough to fulfill, make me fulfilled and feel fulfilled. With this, I can retire every day and have a brand new tire again. Oh, I don't think you're excited. Some of you are sitting back there. What's he talking about? <laughs> oh, I pray to God that I'm connecting with you. You know, when you are a servant of Christ, like Paul, Peter, John, you know, those first century servants of Christ, you'll never really find them bragging about their titles. Hey, Careful, young man, I'm an apostle. Watch your language. I'm one of the church leaders here. Those men never brag about positions. They understood their position in Christ. Christ never bragged about king and king of kings. He never bragged about his glory. He was found to be the servant of all. As a matter of fact, he said, I came not to be served, but to serve. A true man of God is a servant. Can I say that again? A true man of God is a servant. When God comes into your life and mind, he turns us so in such a way that we, found, we find ourselves in the most humble of places. You're so humbled, you don't even think you're any good. But that's when God takes pride in you, and he wants to use you. Because he can take something from not any good to something that's good. Because he's a good God. Somebody asked me, Pastor Wally, what's God telling you today? I said he was telling me that he's still good. In another con convention not too long ago, a woman came up to me. Pastor Wally, what's your message today? I'm like, Jesus. The goodness of the Father. And that's what I'm talking about. I began with grace. I want us to understand there's a cross that came with grace. You can be gracious, but without the cross, it's not complete. When I stood before the high court at the reading of my death sentence, the Lord reminded me of two things to encourage me. The first reminder was the cross. 
2,000 years ago, fast forward to the present, I got saved centuries after that. The cross is connected like a scarlet thread to my salvation. My salvation opened the gateways of heaven to receive grace moment by moment. God is gracious. He sends the Son to all men, believer and unbeliever. He sends rain to all, believer and unbeliever. But he's not as gracious as he is to us, who are his own sons and daughters. He's gracious to an unbeliever, so that the unbeliever can be saved. But to a Christian like you and me, he's more gracious because we are targets of the enemy. The unbelievers are no longer the targets of sin. From the day you sign up to be a child of God, there begins the day you are marked the devil. You are target. To a point you become number one most wanted. And I was able to accomplish that not because of me, but because of the grace of God in my life. Letters were circulated all over the kingdom of Arabia, addressed to every corporate director, every government agency, every department head. No matter who you are, where you were, you received the same letter. Number one most wanted man in Saudi Arabia. If you know this man or he is in your company or in your, under your, uh, your supervision, please let us know immediately. We'll come to take him. Number one most wanted. And they wrote under that the, the description. Why? The reason. First reason. He, is, he, has, he has become a threat to Islam. Hey. What's the point being born again if we don't, we, we don't become threats? To the falseness of religion around us. I was a threat to my own family, my mom, my dad, and my siblings the moment I got saved. They said, how dare you turn around, turn away from the Catholic Church? I said, no. The Lord pulled me away. Where I am now, I want you to have as well. He wants freedom for you. When I grew up a Catholic, I was under the rules and regulations of the church, of the Catholic church. The titular head was the Pope in the Vatican. Under the Pope, he had cardinals and archbishops and bishops and regular priests. In the kingdom of God, when I got born again, I began to read the Bible. My title is Ambassador. I'm not a pope. <laughs> I'm an ambassador. What's your family background, Pastor Wally? You want to know? My father owns the cattle on a thousand hills, including the hills. You know, my ancestry goes all the way back. You remember the great flood? There was only a few that survived. God would always move with number. He didn't just save Noah. He saved a few more people. Our God is a, good, is a God of numbers. That's why there's a book called Numbers. But some are so caught up with numbers. I want to pastor a mega church. And some did and do. That was my desire as a pastor. But God, the first service we had, there were only three of us. What a great encouragement to cry out to God. And I asked God, is this a sign that I should not at a church. And the Lord said, open your Bible. I opened my Bible. I pointed my finger. 
Matthew 1820. When two or three are gathered in my name, I am there in the midst of them. My daughter had to remind me, Dad, you have preached on that word. When you see the attendance dwindling, there's no reason for us to be discouraged. Because there's still more than three of us. Me, your, my mom, you, my husband, your grandson, there's five. More than good enough reason for you to continue to serve God. You know, I was abducted in Arabia. You, you heard me last night. Having become number one most wanted. They could not take me in because I was well connected with VIPs in the land. Royal family and general, especially my wife. You see her, a tiny, petite young, young lady. But she's well connected with royal family in Arabia. She's the sought after nurse. When they get sick. They would send a royal limousine to fetch her, take her to the palace. But that's what God can do. Why she was singled out was no reason but because of her prayerful life. She prayed for every sick member of the royal family in the hospital. She prayed for prime ministers and, and dictators, the likes of Saddam Hussein and others, Muammar Gaddafi, when they were confined. What marks you to be a man and a woman of God is also your prayer life. And because of that, all of these VIPs, to repay the goodness and kindness that they find from my wife, uniqueness, they say, if you need anything, let us know. So when I, got ta- when I was abducted by the religious militants of Arabia, these people of terror and just terrifying men, Controlling the entire nation. My wife began to pray and she began to call each and every one of her contacts. And everyone said, that's easy. Did your husband kill a person? No. He's as innocent as anyone else. Well, then that's easier. We can get him out. We have so much power in the land, we can take him out. Days pass, weeks pass, months, nothing. Until the Lord broke through the life of my wife. She was praying, let me tell you, she was praying for my release. And then one day, my daughter told her, her mother, Mama, look up. Sometimes we are so down to earth, we forget there's a kingdom. No wonder the Apostle Paul was also very down to earth. But after he got saved, he told us to look up. Set your heart on things above, where Christ is seated. Set your minds on things above and not on earthly things. When she heard that from Precious, my daughter, she turned around and said, Lord, I don't care. I don't care about these VIPs. I don't care if they have enough power to, re- to release my husband. I just know that you are King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And I submit to you, my husband Wally, your servant on death row. The day she said that prayer, she said she felt peace that passes all understanding. We need to learn to let go of the most precious things in life that include a person, or a possession. Let go and let God be in charge. The moment she let go, (coughs) 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 that was a commercial break. Hot water, brother. The moment she let go, that's when God began to move mightily. It had to happen in a way where I came very close to the day of execution. My wife came to see me. And that day she declared before the ears, with the ears of the guards and myself. She said, tomorrow, December 23, before 12 midnight, 
I believe Christ is still on the throne. In the mighty name of Jesus, you will be set free to come out alive and not be dead. Bye-bye, turns around and walks away. I'm like, where did that come from? I was so earthly at the time. I was approaching execution. Knowing the history of Arabia, no one has ever been exempted or excused. Everyone has been killed in the public square with thousands watching your execution. <coughs> with God, all things are possible. You can lay hold on that promise alone. You can lay hold on what the Holy Spirit made me declare before the high court. I shall not die but live and declare the works of my God. Men, we are dying on this earth daily. More men are dying daily in today's world. But that can be put to an end. We shall not die, but we will live and proclaim the works of God. You are a work of God. I am a work of God. The Bible is so clear. You get born again, you receive Christ, you are justified just as if you've never sinned. You're justified because of the blood of Christ, the grace of God. The process begins that we become, we become a workmanship of God. He's not done with us. He keeps working in your life and mind. While he is, he allows us to go and serve him. It is through that process, the Bible calls sanctification. Sanctification is not like... It's not like more than that. Those are basics. Sanctification is a life experience. Walking through life with Jesus. And you begin to see the change and transformation. You are the first to witness that change. He will prove himself to you. It is a lifetime process. Pastor Wally's term is, for sanctification is, retirement. Will you connect now? Thank you, brother. Retirement. We're, we're in the process. Sanctification is not done. There's no period. We're in a process. Some are more advanced. Some are less advanced. Some are younger. Some are less mature. Some are more mature. We all go through these stages. It is a lifetime process. You'll come to a point in your life, they'll give you a microphone, you could talk nine hours non-stop. I'm not going to do that today. <laughs> I hold the present world record, longest preaching. Nine hours solid. No, no breaks, no bathroom breaks, no coffee break. Nine hours solid. By the time it was over, the pastors were like, hey, you guys ready for lunch? The host said, what do you mean lunch? We're preparing supper. <laughs> when eternity comes into the picture, when Christ is in the picture of your life, your prayer time knows no limits. Your meditation of the word knows no limits. It's good to be organized. I'm going to set 5 till 6 in the morning, prayer. 6 till 7, word of God. 7 till 8, time to take my care of my body. After that, time with my wife. You can program that every day. It's a routine. But you are, if you are a child, a born of, God, born of God, born again, you are a man of God, you live free 
and not bound by time. Because time has encaptured today's culture. We don't walk according to time. We walk by faith. I remember a, a church in the south. The pastor said, you have 20 minutes to preach, Pastor Wally? He smiled. <laughs> <laughs> you turn over the pulpit to me, forget your watch. Let's talk about Jesus. Before you know it, I was going two hours already. The pastor was in tears. He got born again. <laughs> Another church had me. All the leaders were there. The elders, the deacons, right in the front seats. I was thinking the sinner should be in the front seat. They should be in the back. I went for five hours. They were like, it's almost midnight. Well, God works in the midnight hour. That's what he did with me. It was close to midnight. When the declaration of Mary, my wife, before 12 midnight, she called the day, that the time, midnight. And it was about midnight when I was set free by the king of Arabia. So, when I made the altar call for salvation, the men on the first row were the first to come to the front and kneel. Everyone got saved that night. One of them grabbed me afterwards and took me to the pastor's office. It was the pastor. He was in tears. Pastor Wally, we got saved tonight. I've been in the motion. I did everything right before men. I am a graduate of an outstanding seminary. I have a PhD. Everything was here. But never has it occurred on me that there's a grace that can penetrate. It has changed me instantaneously. And I said, and he told me, those men who came, the first one to respond, were my board of elders and my board of deacons. They've never been saved like me. Imagine! Imagine the congregation that's come and gone, walking this earth, attending church services. They have never been saved, never been born again. And then they dare to be called pastors, apostles, prophets. I have to land the plane. Steve, I love you, man. My friend Doug, you know, he owns a plane, he's a pilot, and I know what it's like to be a pilot. I, I worked with the airlines before, and I sometimes flew with just within the, inside the cockpit. Huge 747s and DC-10s, you know, I mean the cockpit with the pilots. So I knew the operation, I kind of had an understanding of the operation and everything. The communications with ground crew and everything and the control tower. And you know what? Your life and mine is like we're flying our own planes, but we need some control. Without the control towers, we might crash. We have a strong tower. He is my refuge, my rock, my strong tower. He is my hiding place. I hope you believe in the same one that I believe in. 
I prayed and I prayed and I prayed last night and today that God would use these two sessions in the morning to overhaul all of us, including myself. I needed to pay attention to what the word was being preached earlier. I needed to pay attention to the songs being sang. At the same time, I needed an open heaven for the voice of God to speak to my heart. Everything going on was important to me, but most important and vital was an open heaven waiting for the Lord to tell me something about what I'm hearing and what I'm doing, what I'm participating in, because there's more when I hear from him who is the God of grace. And I, I sure did hear it. And when you hear, gentlemen, you don't have to worry about the words to speak. Jesus said, I'll give you the words. Holy Spirit will give you the words. And he does. He does. He did. He continues to do so. But let's land the plane. You want to hear more of my testimony? I invite you to come to Bethesda, right? Yes. I'm going to give a full-blown testimony tomorrow. It might last for several hours, but we'll try to cut it down to an hour, right, brother? Oh, hallelujah. You want to hear? <clears throat> what I shared to you earlier is all about Christ in my life. In my own experience, being born again. A man capable of failure and committing sin, being tempted every day of my life, I'm just like any one of you. But I think there's a major difference here. Because every time I wake up, I invite him. I tell him, Lord, I want your involvement, total involvement. I'm not going to dare step out of this bed without you involved in my life. I remember Moses. We're not going to live. We're going to not, not walk away from this until your presence goes with me. Do you ever pray that prayer? I'm not going to breathe the next second of air here if you're not going to be with me. And God appreciates and loves that. That gives him an open door and a freedom to do what he can and he will in your life. So that no weapon formed against you will ever prosper. He will make you above, not below, the head, not the tail, the first and not the last. So let's land the plane, dog. Let's go to a book written by a man of grace as well to introduce grace and peace greetings. Romans chapter 15. Turn your Bibles to Romans chapter 15. It's right next to chapter 14 to find it easier. <laughs> Amen. You find it yet? Not yet? It comes before chapter 16 in the book of Romans. Hallelujah. If you have your cell phones, you can go online and open any translation of the Bible. It's still the word of God. A few things I want to share as we land the plane. What does it mean to be a servant? What does it really mean to be a man of God? A man of steel and yet soft as a velvet. Tender and gracious like the feather of a small bird. You with me? <clears throat> I'm going to read. Romans 15, 14 to 24. <coughs> I believe that's 10 or 11 verses. Is there a way that you can show it on the screen or not? If not, don't worry about it. Hallelujah. I myself... I'm convinced, my brothers, that you yourselves are full of goodness, 
complete in knowledge and complete to instruct one another. I have written I've written you quite boldly on some points as if to remind you of them again because of the grace say grace say it again grace. grace because of the grace God gave me to be a minister a servant the word minister is a servant to be a minister or a servant of Christ, Jesus, to the Gentiles. And we're all Gentiles here unless, unless, unless someone here is born a Jew. To the Gentiles with the priestly duty of proclaiming the gospel of God. So that the Gentiles might become an offering acceptable to God, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. The ministry of the Holy Spirit is the process of sanctification. In the process, we get to know God more and understand Christ deeper and deeper. Therefore, I glory in Christ Jesus. Everything happening to you and me, good or bad, must glorify God. I will not venture to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me. In leading the Gentiles to obey God, but what, by what I have said and done. Verse 19. By the power, say power. power. Say it like you mean power and like, Say it like you have that power. power. Oh, hallelujah. That shook the gates of hell. By the power of signs and miracles, through the power of the Spirit, capital S. So from Jerusalem all the way around to Elicrum, I have fully proclaimed the gospel of Christ. It has always been my ambition to preach the gospel where Christ was not known. So that I, ha- I, will not, I would not be building on someone else's foundation. Rather, as it is written, those who were not told about him will see. And those who have not heard will understand. This is why I have often been hindered from coming to you. And Paul writes about the plan to visit Rome. Here in these verses, we find major keys to becoming an effective servant of Christ. You cannot serve God if your life is not a life of grace a recipient of grace, and a giver of grace. And that begins with self and begins at home with family. Some people have the guts to serve, leaving behind family. They become absentee husbands or absentee dads. I have counseled so many pastors who had family trouble but they look good on television. They're an embarrassment to the kingdom. But people applaud them. They do not know the story behind the scenes. When I say the behind the scenes, it's S-I-N-S, not S-C-E-N-E. I can be moved so many times to tears praying for this man. It happens. You have to be a man of grace if you are to serve the Lord. Don't even dare serve God in a church setting if you are not a man of grace. You need much grace. 
in order to be effective as a representative of Jesus. You don't represent yourself. You represent Christ who died for them too. You've got to have grace to be a servant. Grace is received and grace is shared. Grace multiplies and spreads to many more. Be a man of grace. Verses 14 that we read, verse 14, I myself am convinced, my brothers, that you, yourselves are full of goodness, complete in knowing and, and, and complete in instruct, in complete to instruct, complete in knowledge, complete to instruct one another. I have written you quite boldly on some points as if to remind you of them again because of the grace of God gave, the God, grace God gave me. God gives us grace to be a minister of Christ Jesus with priestly duties. Second, if you are a true servant, the gospel should always be in your heart and in your life. I mean, you are a source of good news. You don't just say, John 3, 16. No, you don't yell at your wife like that. You don't yell at your son, your daughter that way. You treat them with grace. Let them see. Jesus said, you are the light of the world. Let people see your good deeds so that they will glorify God. In other words, you must be centered with the gospel. You must always be good news to everyone around you. If you are, you have, you have reached a point in life where you know you have good news and you have become good news, the point of salvation is so that the bad in me, in you, can be turned around to be good. And if that goodness cannot be tasted and witnessed by others, what good was your salvation? Is God a good God? Is He a good, good Father? Yes, yes. Then be a good carrier of the good news. You breathe out good news. You speak out good news. You act in good faith. The good news. You relate as a good man of God. That's a servant's heart. You look at the century of times of Christ and the Apostle Paul, and even before them, they understood what slavery is all about. A slave will do nothing but good for his master. Even so tired, no sleep at all, so weary, if the master asks for something, that servant is ready to go and do good for his master. That's why I call it retirement. Man, where's Pastor Wally? He's in Philadelphia somewhere preaching. Oh, he should be in the bed, on bed in bed. I was in bed already a few hours ago. I've retired. The ministry should be centered and focused on good news. And that's you and me. We must be centered and focused on being good news. First to God and then to others. <clears throat> I believe you find that better in verse 16, which we read, to be a servant of Christ to the Gentiles with priestly duty, proclaiming the gospel of God. Wow. 
<laughs> so that, he said, the Gentiles might become an offering acceptable to God. Meaning, I am already acceptable, but I've got to do something. I've got to be good in every way so that they can become an offering themselves to God. Paul said it very prompt, pr- correctly when he said, you know, offer your body a living sacrifice, which is your act of worship. See, worship is not limited when Doug and the guys would lead us into singing. So many people have that mentality. Hey, it's time to worship. Let's go to the sanctuary. Oh, no, 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 no. The coming together is for us to have fellowship with the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And the spirit of worship is a heart given up to Christ, a, God, a life surrendered to God, a life that's wrapped around the will of God, a life that honors God in every way, a life willing to serve God and serve others for His glory. That is your daily worship. We are worshiping God when we live a life like that. This is a bonus. Aha. You get new tires. This is the application that makes it bright and shiny. <laughs> hallelujah. Thank you for that hallelujah, brother. Number three. Every service we do is meant to glorify God. Meant to glorify God. No servant, no slave. You just read the word slave and find the true meaning and where it came from. It will tell you something like this. A true slave does everything for the good of the master. He won't do it so that he will get applauded by crowds. You know, when the emperor of Rome stood before the population, they would either roar into praise or be quiet to listen to every single word he speaks. That's how they honor him. They were his subjects. Practically, they were his slaves. You don't submit to that, you're in trouble. And a servant knows that. A slave knows that. I don't want to get into trouble. I don't want to lose my eternal benefits. I don't, get, I don't want to be applauded by people. I want people to rise up and applaud my boss. Why him? Why him? <laughs> Why him? Because, because he, does, he does do a good job in my life. That, so that I have nothing to do but be the best for him. And when I do that, if I'm a waiter and I serve greatly and humbly and with dignity and honor, everybody will be like, whoa, you got a good employer here. This is a good restaurant. If you cook and you do the best cooking ever, people will applaud you. Amen. I call it retirement. Done for the glory of God. Look at verse 17. Therefore, I glory in Christ Jesus in my service to God. In my servanthood to Christ. I'm a slave of Christ. And I glory in that. That's why I am passionate. I can preach and talk on and on because I glory in the, in the Lord, my master, who rescued me, who saved me, who paid for my, the penalty of my sin. He deserves it all. I'm not going to preach here with a mediocre sermon. So many pastors do that already. Why should I be one of them when I can be different? So when you are right there in the amen ministry, be your best to out amen the rest. When people say amen, you go, amen, hallelujah. That's what I do when I'm in the back. When I'm in a pew sitting. And I'm listening to other preachers. Oh, I hope you got it. The word glory is simply boasting about what Christ 
has done and who he is. Number four. We're landing the plane, right, brother? Yeah, number four. Ministry, servanthood. Servanthood is most effective when done in the power of God. See, when my boss would send me when I was in Arabia, go to that prince, go to that general. You know, I would not be entertained by anyone else. Security in the gates won't even let me in. But then I have a badge of authority for my boss. I tell him, hey, General so-and-so sent me, and, you know, I, I got a message for your boss and everything else. And I was in the armed forces of Saudi Arabia. I'm not in the army or airport, no. I was a civilian worker, personal administrator. To a point where everywhere we went, or I went, the people, the Saudi Arabian military recognized Wally. There are instances when I walked through a group of uh, troops or a gate manned by troops, and they would go, They know I represent somebody. A captain was fired for doing a lousy job. He comes to me, Wally, you're close buddies with the general. Please, I need my job. I have a family to feed. Amen. I'll pray, pray for you. And I'll find the perfect time when I'm all by myself with my boss. I said, sir, with all due respect, do you love your family? He said, yeah. How do you show your love to your family? I'm the breadwinner in my family, Wally. What are you talking about? I bring in the bacon. I provide. My wife has her own car and chauffeur. My children go to the best schools. That's how you show your love. Yeah. How will you show it if suddenly you fell ill and you lost your job and your position? He said, I've never thought of that. I said, are you ready for that? He said, no. I don't think anyone else can swear to you. And I guess, sir, an officer that I know was let go. Paycheck was the last, last month. His benefits have been withdrawn, completely cut off. He's a man married with children. He's going to go hungry very soon. And his children. What would you do if there was something you can do for that man? I would reinstate him to his job. Then do it, I said. <coughs> He's like, what's his name? Here. Yeah. I already prepared a letter. I said, just sign this document. A Saudi Arabian captain is restored to his job. It happens a few times. But what I'm, what I'm trying to say here is that true servanthood is done by the power of God. God gives us the Holy Spirit for good reason. He knows we are powerless. God knows we cannot be the man that we are that He wants us to be. That's why He gave the Holy Spirit. It was the Holy Spirit, ladies, I mean, gentlemen, it was the Holy Spirit that turned around ordinary man to become man of God. It was the Holy Spirit that made Peter and John face the same authorities that condemned Christ to death. And they declared, we would rather obey God than man. Oh my goodness, they were bold all of a sudden. When they would raise more men to work with them, what was the number one qualification. This man must be filled with the Holy Spirit. Because they recognize until they experience the presence 
of the Holy Spirit, they did not have any power. But the moment they had it, they were walking to the temple. A crippled man, 40 years old, more than 40, begging for money. They had more to give than money. I can give you money now. It's only good for a week grocery. I can give you something. It's worth for you to live on. Silver and gold we don't have. But in the name of Jesus, you rise up and walk. Woo! Everybody go, woo! woo! Amen. Oh, my God. You read something like that in the Bible, in my lesson, I'm like, whoa! My grandson turns and like, whoa! <laughs> when I read the Bible, it's alive. My God is alive. He gives power. You know how Peter would walk by, shadow brings healing to sick people. You know how uh, just a simple piece of cloth touched by Paul had such power and anointing. They, they pass around that cloth and people were getting healed. <laughs> We've had services in church in Arabia. This is every service, not once in a while service. Every service, the Holy Spirit shows up and displays the power of God. I don't have the power. I have the Holy Spirit, though. And when you have the Holy Spirit, then you have the power. And the Holy Spirit did not choose the piano, did not anoint the guitar, did not anoint the microphone, not even the sound system. He anoints the Holy Spirit is given to men of God. When you are a man of God, you don't struggle. Even women of God, of course. People ask you to pray. Pray. Pray anyway. People don't ask you to pray. Pray anyway. You see an opportunity? Pray. I get calls every day. People asking for prayers. Can you imagine a call coming all the way from Denmark? My phone rings 2 in the morning. This is a man, a multi-millionaire, about to commit suicide. He types the word suicide. He types the words Christian, I mean, crisis. And the moment he types that, my name pops up. Hello? I'm like, heaven high. It's two in the morning here in California. Where are you from? Calling you from Denmark. Oh, it's midday, Denmark. But he said, I'm about to commit suicide. Your name, Pop. The number is there. I call you. And he says, Who are you? <laughs> I said, God raised me up to be an answer to your problem. I'm one that will bring the voice of God to your heart. Why did you call me? He said, I'm about to kill myself. I'm like, good. Because I have something to tell you before you do that. I didn't say, I didn't say I'm going to stop you. I have something to share to you before you do that. What is it? There's a man who came to my life. I was in the worst shape. He touched me. I got so much tears of remorse and repentance. I felt the fire I've never known in my life. It was a holy presence that came. And before I knew it, I invited him into my heart. And I gave all my life to him. If you will only give him just a few sec seconds and then do whatever he tells you to do. 
I didn't say, do whatever you plan to do. Do whatever he tells you to do. He was weeping. I could hear his sobs. Are you talking about Jesus? Have you heard of him? Yeah. My parents brought me to church when I, I was born and raised in Los Angeles. But I found that I was after fame and wealth and power and I gained it all, but meaningless. I'm a ruined family man. I've lost my wife and my kids. Nobody cares. I employ hundreds of people. They go home with good paychecks. I'm not satisfied. I'm not fulfilled. I'm a wretched man. I said, that's good. Because God has the answer. Make a long story short, a two hour and a half call closed with the man giving his heart to Jesus. That I might be a minister of Christ, a servant of Christ, the Gentiles. Serving him with the gospel of God. That the offering of the Gentiles might be acceptable. That man's life was turned around, immediately he was acceptable to God. He was embraced and sanctified by the Holy Spirit. Those calls, those phone lines, we don't need phone lines. We have open lines from heaven. Call to me, I will, I will answer you. He said, and can I share one more story? There's a woman from Ethiopia, very desperate, suffering so badly. On the internet, she typed, she type, I'm a woman in crisis. I need help. <laughs> My website shows up. So she calls. Oh my God, it was about three in the morning. I'm like, oh Jesus, you have such a way to tickle me, you know, to humor me. But I pick up. Make a long story short, the woman was also suicidal. My website doesn't say the word suicide at all. But God knows to direct, how know how to direct people to the right person. I have story after story to tell you about people like that. Even pastors and ministers do that. The point is this. We cannot do anything without the power of God. I suggest to you men, seek God for the power of the Holy Spirit. Don't settle by the simple fact. I, I'm saved. The Bible says I have the Holy Spirit. And that's it. And why is my life so boring? Why am I not really zealous about the things of God? I go from conference to conference. I go back again every year. Nothing has changed. Why? You know, the Holy Spirit is a God of change and power. If you are a person baptized in the Holy Spirit, He will make you experience the life of Christ. He will make Christ alive in you. You speak the words of life and spirit. The Bible says these signs will follow those who believe. You are not after signs and wonders. They follow you. We need the power. We need that power. We desperately need it now. People are praying for revival. True. But we need the power of the Holy Spirit more than revival. If you have revival, if you have the power of the Holy Spirit, you are a revived person. You don't need revival. In the kingdom of Saudi Arabia, for the many years that the church has been there since we were there, we never talk of revival. We're always alive in Christ. To revive means to somebody that's half dead or 
really is struggling to have life, you resuscitate them, you pump oxygen, you really do everything, vitamins here, injections there, to revive the person. That's what revival is. I walk into the churches of America, these people don't look sick. What they need is the Holy Spirit's power. Men of God, if we are to become the man of God, what God wants us to be to yourself, be man enough to accept that you cannot do anything without His power. Be man enough to accept you cannot be the most effective father if you don't have the power of the Holy Spirit. Be man enough to accept the fact you cannot be the best father if you do not have the power of the Holy Spirit. Just read the Bible. It will save us more time. Nine hours will be cut down now. I call it retiring. I want to close with this final thought. Whatever plan you and I have must always line up with the plan of God. You plan to get married, young man? Line up your life to be in the will of God. Husband, love your wife as Christ loves the church. There is trouble because men are not men enough to love their wives. A true man will love the wife no matter how nagging it may be. Naggers are born to strengthen men. <laughs> they are not born to separate, to divorce. They are born to strengthen you and me. There's the goal, the answer there. Woo! If you agree, go woo! woo! Yeah. According to God's plan, always. If you're a man of God, you will raise the best sons and daughters. California state law, you're not going to beat your child. Heaven's law. Don't spare the rod. I have one daughter. She got it from daddy. It made her the woman that she is now. A godly woman. A woman who serves the Lord. A woman who prays really hard. And it digs deep into the word of God. She's a woman of faith. She's 32 years old now. She's a fulfilled dentist. She's a worship leader, she's a youth pastor, and she's a preacher. Some men don't like that. Oh, we don't believe in women preachers. Then don't. That's your problem. I'm not going to convince you. But what's the fruit, though? The fruit is because men of God like us won't spare the rod. We tell the child the truth. I'm your father for good reason. And the truth is, our God is our father for good reason. He disciplines his own. He, why, do, why does he discipline us? So that our misdirected alignment will be aligned properly because we have new tires. New tires deserve alignment. If they're not balanced, they're not Why you do that? Goodness. It's like time to, time to land the plane. <laughs> Woo! Hallelujah. Ah, time to land the plane. Dog, come on, gears down. Hallelujah. Praise God. All right, to be a servant, 
You must be gracious. To be a servant, you must be a center and a focus of good news, a giver and a messenger of good news. To be a servant, you've got to give, do all you can to glorify God in every way. And to be a servant, don't do anything without the power that God gives you. When God gives you that power, you remember this. You have power and you have authority. That's why in the name of Christ, oh, demons tremble. It's so easy to cast out demons. You don't struggle much. In the church in Arabia, there were, were a demon-possessed man from Sri Lanka. We were worshiping and the demon manifested. I'm like, what is this guy doing here? I mean, the devil, you know? So the elders grabbed the man and they put him in the room. You could hear, boy, they could not tackle the man. I just finished the worship. I went on with the sermon. And after that, I went to the room. I'm like, what's going on? And they're all sweating, the men. <laughs> the man is sitting in a corner. And a pastor, we tried all we can. Have you tried the Holy Spirit's power? They said, no, no word. And I looked at the man, I'm like, you're a child of God. You're possessed by the Spirit of Christ. You're owned by God. He bought you with a price. Therefore, you have to live up to what God gave you. Right now, I kick out every demon spirit from you. And demon spirit, I command you. I don't know what name you have. I don't know how many, I, I don't care how many you are. In the name of Christ, go, set this man free. Go, don't come back ever again. In the mighty name of Christ. The man was normal after that. <laughs> Can you do that? Come on, do it. Get up, get up. Let's do it. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Woo, woo. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Woo, woo. Hallelujah. Oh, I love it. We're a bunch of crazy men. Crazy for Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Brother, I appreciate you. Appreciate you, all these men, young and old. I appreciate the one lady, in the, uh, two ladies in the back. I appreciate you all. It's all about Jesus. Amen. We're ready to retire. Amen. 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 Let's retire. Amen. Brother, come here. 